Oh yeah, filling up. Hey, there it is. Good evening. Good Being evening, Dan. That, good evening, guys. That sound means we are live, and wow, the chat room is filling up quick. Maybe a little quicker than usual, usual, Jared. So that might be a good sign for things to come today with our guest who just disappeared. Holy cow, Lou Mangello, <laughs> our guest, just dropped off the chat the minute you folks joined us. So congratulations, mm -hmm. uh, you guys kicked off Lou. So we Jared, promise Lou's here. <laughs> so Jared, with that, it looks like I'll be interviewing you tonight. How are you, Jared? <laughs> I, I'm doing good, and I see we got some good people in the chat room. We've got uh, David Potts, we've got Crystal, we've got Ellen and Ed and Jeff Jackson, Eric, Jose Gomez, Larissa, oh, Team Larissa, John, Karen, Lorraine, Matt, Shane, and Philip and Ray and Steven and Tony and Vicky. My goodness, yeah, and people keep pouring in as if Peyton is here tonight. So, yeah, this is a, a, a pretty cool group we got. I'll tell you what, though, the uh, unfortunate part is of all those people that are joining us live, Lou is not one of them. I think Lou backed off. Lou will probably be trying to log back in. I think the issue was he wanted to join us all in the chat room. And Lou has now joined us back <laughs> on screen. Lou, what's going on, man? I wanted to be fashionably late. You know, I wanted to make a dramatic exit and then come back fashionably late. Is that like a Disney thing? Or? <laughs> so, so we did not give Lou the proper introduction. So Lou decided to make another entrance. So this time we would. So Jared, why don't why don't you do give Lou the royal introduction treatment? I don't know that you can properly introduce Lou because Lou has accomplished so many things, but Lou is one of those people, and we're going to talk more about this, but Lou is a person who was a lawyer, and then in 2007, he decided he didn't want to be a lawyer anymore, and he wanted to pursue that dream job, and he went all in on podcasting about Disney, and that has actually served him really well. Uh, he's been very fortunate to develop an amazing community. He's actually doing uh, an awesome Disney cruise right before podcast movement with 550 members of his Walt Disney World Radio community. And that that's what Lou's up to, Walt Disney World Radio and just doing big things with Disney. I mean, this guy gets flown out to conferences all over North America and in different countries where he's speaking about Disney and just doing some really neat things. Lou, it is an absolute pleasure to have you. Lou is also a multi-winner of podcast awards, uh, what, seven in a row? I mean, you're like the Ric Flair of podcast <laughs> awards. <It's, laughs> <it's insane. laughs> Pretty impressive, Lou. Welcome. I'd better than me in the Susan Lucci of Podcast Awards, so I'll, I'll take it. Rick <laughs> You've been called worse, right? I've been called much worse. Yeah, man, thank you guys so much for having me. This is awesome. All right, Lou. So, I mean, there's plenty of people in here that are thrilled uh, to see you, and we're, we're excited to have you. But, Lou, for those that don't know you, and I gave a very brief introduction, but if you're willing, your, your story's fascinating. Let's talk about your story of how you got into podcasting. Yeah, so real quick, um, rewind to back about 2003. I am a lawyer in New Jersey. I have an IT consulting company on the side, so I'm not sleeping very much, but I have this <laughs> idea of making something once and reselling it. Uh, so I have the idea for a book, and all I really know about is, is Walt Disney World. So the personal challenge was, can I write a book, and can I get it published? Can I be validated by somebody? Uh, I learned all I could about the book publishing industry, signed a three-book deal, Created a little two-page brochure website, started writing articles, developed a community, and back in 2005, I saw this new thing, podcasting, coming down the pike, and I realized that the spoken word is so much more powerful than anything that you can write. It can it convey so much more emotion. Of course, not knowing what I was doing, how I was going to do it, if anybody could even find me or would hear me talk about Disney for an hour plus a week, uh, but they did, um, and it was amazing how quickly and how very organically it grew. Uh, long story longer, um, I <laughs> left my full-time job. I ended up selling the house I thought I was going to live in forever. I took the leap of faith, packed the Honda Odyssey, drove to Florida, and I've been podcasting full-time uh, since about early 2007. Wow. Okay, so there it's possible there are people in this chat room right now that are saying, hey, I'm going to start a podcast or I've already started my podcast and the dream is to eventually take that podcast and turn that into something that uh, is a podcast it's the full-time dream job, right? Something they're they're doing and they're earning income from, and and you've actually accomplished that, and you've been doing that for for several years. So, uh, yeah, let's let's walk through that. I mean, how is that possible? How do you just go from driving down to Orlando, Florida, and then all of a sudden, you know, things are are happening with a podcast about Disney? That's interesting. It started actually earlier. So I had the website, I had the podcast, and I was making a couple dollars using things like AdSense and some affiliate things, figuring, okay, it's it's just you know a little bit of extra money. And everything changed, Darren, one day when I got a phone call. And someone says, hey, I've been listening to your show for a while. I love what you do. 
how much to you know would you charge to sponsor your show? And I was like, I have no idea. Let me send you an email with a proposal. And I hung up the phone. I was like, well, now what do I do? Like, I had no clue. And it was a very much an eye-opening experience for me because I said, well, I can't believe that somebody wants to pay me not just to do what I'm doing, but to talk about Disney World and just sort of share something that I loved as a hobby. And uh, as time went on, I, I realized that there was an opportunity here. And as time went on and I learned more and, and you know, we're all kind of learning still trial by fire, um, I found that there was other ways to, to monetize the show. So when I eventually took that leap and moved and made the move, uh, I was already generating income from products and from sponsors and from other things that I was learning to do along the way. So I did take a leap of faith but had a bit of a parachute behind me. I didn't sort of just blindly go in and say, I'm going to just quit and start making money podcasting because we all know it doesn't happen that way. And to be clear, you know, it took years. It didn't take six months. It took years to, to get to that point. Wow. But uh, congratulations because that is a one of my favorite success stories in podcasting for sure. So, all right. So, uh, yeah. So, Dan, do you have any uh, questions you want to kick off with Lou here? Well, so I, I'm right now. I'm I'm doing some uh, some technical work here. We've got Daniel J. Lewis in the chat room, and Daniel awesome. is real good about uh, pi you know wor working with us in the chat room and answering some questions about the technical side of podcasting. Unfortunately, tonight he's showing up as Joseph. So we're uh, <laughs> and, and to make it even funnier, my friend Joseph Berman from California, who's got a really cool project. I've been talking to him about. His name is Joseph, but he's showing up as a ghost man tonight without a name at all. So to make it all the more confusing, that's what's going on. Uh, but but Lou, I, I'm very interested in how you're, you've turned this into a full-time career. And uh, Jared mentioned it earlier about your cruise. Uh, what is that all about? And how has this whole podcasting thing turned into something that you're now going on these sponsored cruises? So really the most important part of what I do in terms of, of the podcasting and and, and sort of sharing my passion in a lot of different mediums with podcasting and video and blogging and everything else, is I think that so many people lose sight of the importance of face-to-face -face interaction, right? I, I say at the end of every show that I, I feel like the people that listen are my friends, even if, even if I haven't met them yet. And as much as we might connect on Facebook and follow on Twitter and all that kind of stuff, nothing beats a handshake and a hug, right? We, we like the, we, and we lose sight of that offline engagement. So back in 2008, um, I had there used to be a sort of an annual convention of Disney fans, and people say, "Oh, I can't get down, but I would love to sort of get together." So, well, look, I'm in Disney World every month, every anyway, even when I was commuting back and forth from New Jersey. I said, "Look, I'm going to be there. Let's just do a meet." And I didn't even know what a meetup was at that point. I'm like, "I don't know. I'm going to be there, figuring like maybe one or two people might show up um, because there really was no social media back then." And I was surprised that people wanted that too. They wanted to meet like-minded people, know that they had friends along the way. So I've been doing Meets of the Month free in Walt Disney World every month, save for two, since January of 2008. But what that does is it allows you to build off that because people like those kind of events. They become friends. They the, the friendships become much more real. So when you say, hey, let's do an event. Let's rent out an attraction in Walt Disney World and have dinner in there. Let's go on a group cruise. Let's go to California. Let's go to Disneyland, wherever it is. People want to be part of that. So I've been doing a cruise for the past, I don't know, four or five years uh, on the Disney Cruise Line, of course. And, you know, the people come together. The community comes together from all around the world. We've had people from, like, Japan and Norway and Germany wow. come out. Um, and we get, you know, like last time we had about 500 people join us on the Disney Dream and then the Disney Fantasy for four- and seven-day cruises. And it's awesome, you know. And everybody's got, like, a yellow lanyard. And when you take over a quarter of the ship... Everywhere you go, you see somebody with that credential on, and you know that you've got a built-in friend. And people go alone. They go without their kids. They go with their kids. They go as couples. And it's a, it's a pretty amazing experience. So are you able to actually kick back and relax, or are you just in go, go, go <laughs> mode the whole time? Uh, I'm in go, go, go mode. Um, you know, when you have 500 people, it's like a really, really big Italian wedding. <laughs> so you try and, like, <laughs> see everybody as often as you can. And we do a number of events and things like that, and we take over a dining room for dinner so... I want to meet everybody. Like I want to say hi to everybody. I want to hear their story. I want to, you know, meet their kids and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it, it's not a complaint at all. Like I'm the most blessed, luckiest guy on the planet to call that work. Um, but it's, uh, it is. It's a lot of fun, but it does not a lot of sleep. Like I think that my family's on board. I don't really see them that often. So right. Well, I, okay. So follow up question. 
what movie is the samurai sword in the background from? What Disney movie? <laughs> not, it has nothing to do with Disney at all. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, I was thinking Mulan. All right. Uh, yeah, I guess you could probably say Mulan, or I'm sure there's a sword in there somewhere that I'm not. Th- yeah, I've just um, uh, I I took martial arts uh, a lot when I was a lot younger, and I was fascinated by Japanese culture. So, um, just in case you know something goes down, I have my sword behind me. So yeah, I just I like my katana on my <laughs> thing behind me. There you go. Well, I'm I'm a Kill Bill fan. My uh my old podcast setup had the Kill Bill sign and or poster in the background, so uh, it would have fit more in with my decor than yours. I I must say. Um, I have a question. We keep seeing this term "box people" in the chat room. What is what what is a box person? Yeah, it sounds violent. Like you need a sword. It's not. Um, so the box people is this amazing thing that was a derivation of what I was doing. So back in like 2007, I'm I'm still living in New Jersey, and again, I, you're always thinking about what's next. And I see that this new technology comes out that allows you very easily and cheaply to do live video broadcasts. So I see this thing called Ustream, and I'll never forget the conversation. After dinner, I told my wife, I said, listen, I, I had a discussion forum um, on my site, like a v discussion, discussion forum. I said, look, I'm going to try this thing out. I'm going to just post it in the forums. Like, nobody's going to show up. I'll be on for 10 minutes, and I'm going to try this, like, live video broadcast thing. She's like, you're a freak, whatever. I'll see you later. She goes upstairs. Six hours later, she comes down. She's like, what are you doing? Like, who are you talking to? I'm like, I don't know, but there's like 200 people like watching. Like, she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know, like anything. Like, we're talking about nothing. And this thing was born. Like, people, as much as the the spoken word is powerful, people love to be able to see what you're doing. They want to sort of peek behind the curtain. They want to like be able to see. And what I liked about it was because everything I was doing was such a push conversation. The, the, the blog and the podcast and magazines and books, I wanted that two-way interaction real time, and that's what that gives to me. So in time, I used to walk around like with my laptop, right? So I'd be walking around like the parks with my laptop, or I'd be in an event with my laptop live broadcasting, and I said one night, just completely offhand, I was like, oh, it's like I'm carrying around all of you in a box. like you And they're like, yeah, we're your box people. And I'm like, the box? And... The thing is, and it's a testament to that community, they created it, right? They create this this idea of the box people. They wanted they created logos, they created shirts, they created all kinds of like stuff. And this sort of sub community has grown from the podcast. And I do it every Wednesday and people wear that box people moniker proudly, right? Because they're part of it. again, they want to belong to something. And and they're an amazing group of people, and I see a lot of people in the chat room our box people transplants who came over from the, uh, <laughs> from the chat that we were having earlier tonight. They are welcome. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so we, we have some questions from the audience, and I think, hey, let, why not? Let's sprinkle those in. So the first one is from Philip, and he wants to know how you've been able to escape the Disney trademark peeps uh, with the use of WDW and Disney and some of your uh, URLs. So I think what has happened, and you know, it's WDW. It's not you know the Disney podcast or anything like that. But and look, mm-hmm. there are sites that that use Disney in the URL and in the name, right? And I think when you start, and this is right here's the recovering attorney. I mean, this is not legal advice. Please do not construe it as such. But I think <laughs> uh, when you look to using a brand name like that in a domain name or in a URL. There's a couple things that play into it, right? So if you are talking about it in sort of a commentary kind of way, there may be a fair use sort of defense there. Um, Also, uh, in terms of the trademark, as long as there's no brand confusion, right? If you're not trying to hold yourself out as an official Disney blog, an official Disney podcast, like I'm very clear that I don't work for the company. I'm not paid by the – and to be clear, I'm not paid by the company. I pay for my own tickets full price. I pay for all my own meals. All of them, um, I, you know, I pay full price for everything. But as long as there's no brand confusion, I think a lot of the big brands, and Disney, I think, does this very well. They realize that they no longer are in complete control of their message, right? Because their message used to be what they put out on TV and radio and newspapers and magazine ads. But now, with social media and what podcasting, I think they understand and appreciate that what we as third-party content creators provide and bring to the community in terms of filling needs and bringing a different voice, uh, I think they understand that. And Disney is not this big corporate giant that is just looking to squash the little guy and you know uh, that they're worried about every potential 
trademark or copyright infringement. They do when they need to because they need to be protective of their intellectual property, but I think they have certainly opened up their arms and appreciate and invite. Look, I, I'm blessed to be invited to media events and things like that because they understand that we are no longer the Wild West and new media and kids in their basement with a microphone. Like What we are all doing is, is serious stuff, and there's a message that we're putting out there, and I think they've really come to embrace it. Man, that's outstanding. All right, so we, so we have some more questions. Uh, Lou, how did you come up with the idea to do a weekly podcast? Uh, I knew that when I first started in 2005, again, not like I literally had to look up the word podcasting. Like, what is this thing and how are people going to find it? Like, it wasn't in iTunes and we were hand coding. I'm still hand coding my XML. Do as I say, not as I do. We were still yeah. hand coding uh, our, our XML feeds. Uh, I realized that you need to be consistent. Right? We are creatures of habit. We know that Seinfeld's on 11 o'clock every night. That's where we're going to go to be there. So you need to not only satisfy a need because people were starved for content. Right, They weren't getting enough from Disney themselves. They were starved for content, especially with a different kind of voice. And if you are consistent, I think you need to be as a podcaster. You have to have a certain routine, and you can't really break from that. Uh, it's important to build and to grow and to definitely hold on to your audience. Well, Lou, I'm going to, I guess, a follow-up to that, and I think maybe this is what Flip31 was asking, and I think that's somebody from your community, a box person, if you will. <laughs> uh, but the question is, how do you come up with the ideas for the individual podcast? You've been going this long, weekly. I mean, there's got to be weeks where there's just nothing to talk about. What do you do during those weeks? Yeah, and, and yeah, Dave Flip, and I know him, and I've met him, and we are friends. We have met in person. Um, so I've been doing this for almost 10 years, and I can say that I've actually never repeated a topic. Um, because one, the place is always changing, right? And I'm not just talking about Mickey Mouse, which is what my friends in New Jersey thought I was going to be doing. Like, wait, you're going to talk about Mickey Mouse for an hour a week? And I'm like, no, it's a little bit more than that. <laughs> but, you know, and that's what the freedom of being independent gives me, is I can come up with an idea, like I would while we're talking during the show tonight, to do a top 10 segment, to do a live restaurant review, to do an interview, to do a history segment. I can come at it from all different angles because I want to sort of reach people in the, in the way that it look to give them the content that they are looking for. So if they're vacation planning, if they're history people, if they're trivia buffs, if they like interviews, I want to sort of spread it out so there's a little bit of something for everybody. Um, and I don't think I'll ever run out of ideas. Plus, too, when you have a great community like that, they say, hey, I would love to hear an episode about, you know, Journey to Imagination. Well, bang, there's your idea for an upcoming show. Uh, it's, you know, we, we see this influx of people from your community, and every week we have when our guests, they bring some of their own community, but your community is come in and they're, they're vocal and they're, they're passionate. What are some of maybe your, your, one, your couple, two or three most important things you've done that you haven't already talked about to actually build this community and make them these, these huge fans and not just people that just listen? So that's the word right there, and I will tell you, I hate the word fan. Like I just... I, I think that you need to treat your audience like your friends because that's how they look at you from that yeah. very first show and when they start to get latched on to who you are because that's why they listen to your show. They like your content, but they like you. They feel like they're your friends, and I know you guys know this because you go to events and go, oh, God, Jared, just give me a hug, man. Like I loved your last Star of the Doubts episode, and, and box people, you need to subscribe to Star of the Doubts. Um, so you treat those fans like they're friends, and – and I know other podcasters may not agree with me about this. Um, I don't care about statistics, right? I, I stink at it. I don't look at them. I don't care about them because it doesn't matter to me unless you're dealing potentially with, with a sponsor, right? So I don't look at my stats. I don't care about my stats because I would do the same show for 10 people that I would do for 100,000 people, right? Mm. And if you treat those five listeners like they're 5 million, you make them feel important, They'll feel that, right? They'll hear that, and they'll see it, and you answer every email, and you respond to every tweet, and you address guys by their first names, and you recognize them, and they appreciate that, and they become your most loyal advocates and evangelists. Wow. They become your box people. They become your box people. I love the box people. Yeah. <laughs> I and, I am it, a, and I am a hugger. They know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just saw you on Friday, Lou, and I don't, I don't think I got that, that full frontal male hug. And, oh, uh, no. I feel a little left out. So, uh. <laughs> You're going to have to uh, hug him double as much at a <laughs> podcast movement. 
Yeah, that's and awkward. I'll a, and I'll take a selfie while we're doing it, too. Yeah, I'll okay. Uh, it'll be on Instagram. <laughs> Hashtag awkward. All right. <laughs> well, Lou, Ed in the chat room says you have some of the best interviews. What have you done? How did you become such a good interviewer? Um, thank you, and I appreciate that. And I think it's a couple of things. Dare I say it's actually my training as an attorney because as an, as an attorney, you need to ask questions that not only you want to know the answer. Like, first of all, you need to kind of know the answer ahead of time, right? So for people that are looking to do interviews, Look, if somebody you're going to interview, especially somebody that you are a fan of, is giving you their time, man, you darn well better be prepared. Like, you better know the answers to the questions before you ask them. You're asking them because, yes, you want to hear their story. Yeah, you want to hear them say it. But you already know. So I research like a crazy person. Like, I know everything about my guests beforehand, and I want to sort of let them tell their story, but I want to sort of direct it. You know, I usually have a path that I want them to go down and try and help guide them along it. Um, and I think too, and this is the, the key to podcasting, and I know not everybody may be agreeing with this, I believe, and I hate to sort of keep using the word, you need to be passionate about your subject. Anybody can blog about anything. Like if I want to start a cupcake blog tomorrow, I could do it. I, I don't know a lot about cupcakes. I know how to eat them, but I could blog about them and nobody would really tell podcasting, they can hear it, man. They can hear it in your voice. If you don't love it, if you don't believe it, if you're not passionate about it, those people are going to tell. So when I get to interview somebody, and I'm going to totally name drop because I'm, I'm a dork because I was totally nerding out when I did, but when I get to interview like Julie Andrews, man, you better believe I'm going to be ready for that interview, right? And I'm asking the questions I want to ask as a fan, and I want to ask the questions that I think my listeners want to hear as well. Lou, I, I totally see the attorney in you when you talk about your style of interviewing. You want to ask the question, but already know the answer, and that's that's the attorney interview. And there's n I there's two totally different schools of thought there because we've had people on in, in weeks past that say the exact opposite. They say I don't want to know the answers because I want to be I want to ask the questions that come to me naturally over the course of the interview. How do you balance that? Because obviously you're such a good interviewer, you're able to make it either be natural or at least sound natural. So where does that balance come in? Sure, and, and don't get me wrong. I, I'm not only going to ask the questions that I know, you know, where did you grow up? What what did you think about? I want them to be able to to tell their story, right? I, it's all about storytelling, and usually people that are interviewers are hopefully going to be great storytellers. So I don't necessarily know the answer, but I know where I want to lead them, right? I know sort of where I want to go down, and you obviously have to adjust on the fly. Uh, I don't read off a script. I will have bullet points of things that I want to cover, but you need to adjust on the fly, and if you hear somebody say something that, takes you another direction, go with it, you know, and, and let them tell that story to you. So you do need to balance, right? You do need to sort of do your research, and, and that's what I mean by sort of knowing the answer. Like, you need to do your research on the person, but also help them or let them sort of tell the story that you want them to hopefully tell. Uh, Lou, how do you go about securing big guests, in this case, big Disney guests, but for someone who's in the chat who's wanting to get a big guest in their niche, what advice do you have? cash. It's just lots of cash. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, you know, believe it or not, and this is, forgive the, this lame answer, but sometimes all you need to do is ask. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and when I've gotten people like that, uh, you do reach out to them and you establish a level of credibility and trust with them that you are not going to do anything that's, you know, crazy, that you, you do have some credibility behind you and what you're doing. Um, if you've interviewed people in the past, you can go to say, hey, Jared, I'd love to interview you. I've had guests like A, B, C, and D on my show so they can see they're not maybe the first person so that they do have that comfort level. But a lot of times it really is just asking, you know, and asking the right way, obviously. Well, I want to hop in here because we do have some people in the chat room that have not been with us before, and we see these questions coming up a little bit. <laughs> Pod move live. We, we're remiss to not mention this at some point. Mm -hmm. This is the official live weekly webinar series to promote Podcast Movement 2014 this August 15th, 16th, 17th in Dallas. And, of course, we're having Lou on tonight because Lou is one of our featured speakers at Podcast Movement 2014. So that is the, the reason for this. You can find out all about the conference and everything else going on around it at podcastmovement.com. So, Jared, I, just, I, I felt like we needed to throw that in there at some point tonight. 
Yeah, that's for our box, people. Uh, so, so Lou, I, I want to ask you this. There's a lot of Disney podcasts. It's not just Walt Disney World Radio. And you subscribe to that abundance mentality where you like to link arms, you like to network, you like to support other shows. And there are sometimes uh, other niches that aren't as generous. They look at people as competition. Can you speak to that for a little bit? Yeah, so I have been asked sometimes in interviews before, well, you know, who's your competition? And I say, I have none. But I qualify that by saying, I don't mean like, oh, I'm so awesome, I have no... That's not what I mean. What I mean is that unlike terrestrial radio, where you at 9 o'clock need to make a choice, are you going to listen to Howard Stern or are you going to listen to... I don't listen to radio. Whoever else is on... You, no long, you don't have to do that, right? Because you can listen to my show and 20 other podcasts. Because And I believe in my heart of hearts... There is room for all of us. Like, we can all win. We can all do well. I want to see other podcasts succeed. I want to help other podcasts succeed because, you know what? We may all talk about the same topic in a broad scope, but we all bring something different to the table, whether it's different topics, different personalities, whatever it is. So I, I do believe in that. I, I want to see us all win mentality. I, I know that's not <laughs> necessarily the case everywhere. Well, Daniel J. Lewis had a very uh, hard-hitting question, Lou. He wants to know, if you were a Disney princess, what <laughs> Disney princess would you Come be? Come on, Daniel. <laughs> How do you answer that? All right. <laughs> what Disney pre – well, you know, I've gotten the, like, who would you marry, who would you date, you know, and so who would I be? <laughs> oh, man. Um, so thinking out loud, I would probably say, like, Belle or Jasmine – they got a pretty good gig. They're living in yeah. a nice house. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I can pull off the. I don't. I don't think I pull off the midriff that Aladdin that Jasmine wears. So I'll just say Bell. <laughs> wow. So that's a. So everybody, just take a moment, <laughs> visualize Lou Monbello. Yeah. There you go. Um, Lou, so, uh, somebody made a comment, and I want to maybe extend that into a question. They said that there's a lot of Disney podcasts out there. Some of them are cynical, uh, and a lot of people in our in our chat room now, they're very niche with their podcasts as well, and there might be other people in that niche, and it sounds like you've kind of mastered how to, how to effectively uh, appeal to everybody in that niche. How do you do that? So I don't think I do, um, and... and... I, I want to be clear because uh, I, I don't appeal to everybody, right? Uh, you know, um, I, my show is not for everybody. Look, since day one, I have done a very positive show about Walt Disney World, right? And I and I treat my show and the way I produce my show is that I want people to feel like they are sitting around a table at a diner talking about like something that they love with a friend of theirs. I want to talk about the things that make people happy about going to Disney World. Not because I'm paid by Disney, not because I'm a shill for Disney, not because I want free stuff or I want invitations from Disney. I've done it for 10 years because I flip and love the place. Like, I love the way it makes me feel. I love the way I, I feel when I think about it growing up as a kid and taking my kids. And I like sharing with people the things that make us happy about it. Because the people that I think are listening that are stuck in their cubicles in the snow in, like, Wisconsin, like, miserable that they can't be to, in Disney World – they want to be connected to that place, right? They want to think about the things that make them happy, whether it's food, an interview, a top 10, like, and they want to feel like they're hearing it from a friend of theirs. So I do a positive show, not because, it, look, every place has issues and problems. That's just not what I choose to talk about. I like talking about the things that make us happy, and if that's the kind of you know, show you want to hear, then hopefully uh, you'll find something you like. If not, there are, um, there are certainly other shows that I think take a very different approach. Hey, Lou, I'd like, to, I'd like to talk to you about your, your latest book. Um, I mean, it's uh, 102 Ways to Save Money for and at Walt Disney World. And I love the book cover, by the way, and you and I have talked about that. So maybe you can uh, share a quick story about Yeah, we see it in the background there. <laughs> yeah, what, what compelled you to, to write that? It's a product placement, yeah. Yeah, let, I don't know. Share some of those tips. I know it's not podcasting, but I think everybody wants to go to Disney. So, Well, I, I think it is related excuse me, to podcasting. So... I, got, I started down this path by writing a book, right? By getting a book traditionally published, I signed a multi-book deal, which was a trivia book. I wrote the book that I wanted to read, a trivia book about Walt Disney World. But as I was doing this and creating content for so many years, 
consistently the same question that I got week after week from anybody who knew that like I would talk about Disney was, how do I like go? How do I save money when I go? Like, where do I buy the tickets? Where do, where should I stay? And when you start getting a question, I think Jared, you and I talked about this. When somebody asks you a question three times, there's a problem there. Like, there's a problem and potentially a product there. And as podcasters, one of the ways to potentially monetize what you are doing is take your content and repurpose it, whether it's a CD, a course, a book, an ebook, whatever it may be. So I wanted to go down the next road of a, a, a personal challenge. Can I self-publish a book? B, I wanted to solve a problem that I think every Disney fan, no matter what you know financial background you have, has, and sort of bring that to them in a different type of a medium. So I went down the road, I started writing the book, and I did it in a uh, list format because people like easily consumable content, right? I didn't want to write a big fat guidebook. Look, we are a 140 character Pinterest generation. We want things quick. Mm. No fluff, it's just all content in list format broken out by you know where to go, when to go, where to stay, what to eat, the, the answers to the questions that people have most. Uh, and it's been a great journey being able to write the book and publish it and put it out on the different platforms and see the way uh, people have responded. And if you are a podcaster, start thinking about content that you have that you can turn into a product. Yeah, and that's, yeah. you know, we do have a lot of podcasters listening and watching and even more that will be watching the replay later on. And you just hit on one of the biggest things that's always asked about, and that's how to monetize what it is you're doing. You know, you, you mentioned Pat being passionate. A lot of people are passionate. A lot of people are dedicated. They're doing it every week. The last piece that they want to see is some sort of monetization. And you've been doing this long enough. You already talked about books. You talked about some sponsorships. What are some of the other ways that you've been able to make a living off doing what you're doing? So when I talk to people or sort of coach people in terms of podcasting, <clears throat> I really look at it as sort of a three-pronged approach. One is to monetize your audience, and that is by creating products. And it could be everything from, look, I published a print magazine for a while before I sold it, right? I, you create content in the way that they like consuming it. So like I said, there's books, eBooks. I've done audio tours like on, you know, iTunes and, and CD and, and downloads, um, even things like shirts, like the box, you know, you may not make a ton of it, but, you know, create shirts, create products that your audience wants to consume. Remember, you're giving them the podcast for free, and they are very grateful for that, too. And oftentimes, if they like you and what you're doing, they want more of what you will produce. So don't put out junk, right, but you can repurpose some of what you have and bring value to them with some kind of paid product. Two, you could monetize through sponsorships. You could sponsor your get sponsors for your show. You could do events that and have those kind of things sponsored. There's a lot of opportunity there. That that's a you know a much longer, deeper dive conversation. And then three, you could monetize yourself because you as a podcaster, you have now established yourself as a credible expert and authority in that field. Whatever it may be, you no longer need to be published by an author or put on TV or get a radio show. You are building that credibility yourself, your audience knows you, they like you, they trust you, you are now that expert in that field, whatever it may be, right? So you can take that and monetize it by doing things like coaching, speaking, creating products, like in terms of, of a course, like, okay, you've walked the talk, teach other people how to do it, turn that into a product, turn that into a course, turn it into a webinar, turn it into a live seminar, whatever it might be, there's ways to monetize yourself as well. Uh, Lou, I love what Grace writes in the chat room. She says, you've done specialized Disney events which are not available elsewhere, and to a Disney fan, that's huge. So number one, you know your audience, and you know what they want. And then uh, some of these specialized events, I'm curious about that. Like, Would you be willing to share some sure. things that you've been able to pull off that not just anybody can go to Disney and, and do? Yeah, so I like to bring – I like to do things that are special, right, because – I'm a total Disney freak, and I love doing that kind of stuff too. And I do think I want to give that to my friends. I want to share those kinds of experiences with my friends. So I look for things that are a little bit out of the ordinary. Yes, we'll do like a, an Illuminations fireworks party, but I want to do something that's a little sexier. So we've done things like rent out the Adventurers Club, which was sort of this comedy club in uh, Pleasure Island in downtown Disney. We rented out the night before it closed just for our group. We had dinner in there. We had the show. Mm -hmm. 
it was awesome. We rented out the American Adventure Pavilion in Epcot. Last year, we rented out the great movie ride in Disney's Hollywood Studios. They took all the cars out. We had dinner. We had entertainment. It was awesome to be able to just do something that you can't normally do, which is walk through the attraction, go up wow. and touch it and see it and take pictures and spend four hours inside you know, this, this iconic attraction in the parks, even things like the cruises too. You know, you do things that are a little special. We have special guests, whether it's authors like Ridley Pearson or Richard Sherman or whatever it is, things that they can't do otherwise. Those are the things that I, I try and do and I try and bring. And that's awesome. <laughs> like I'm sitting here hearing you talking about that. I'm like, I want to do all of that. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not a hardcore Disney person, so that's cool. All right, so speaking of Disney, let's talk Walt Disney for a little bit. Uh, if Walt Disney were to speak to podcasters, what advice would he give to podcasters? So I think Walt Disney would love – look, Walt Disney was very much a futurist. He was always way ahead of the game. He was always looking to do what was next and to if, – if it wasn't there, he created it himself. Um, I think he would like what, again, we as podcasters are doing, are bringing to the Disney community. Uh, what would Walt say to podcasters? I think he would probably give the same kind of advice he would give to anybody, especially, you know, the creative people, right? You know, do what you love. Surround yourself by good, smart people. Um, you know, have fun doing the impossible. Um, I think he would very much embrace the technology. Mm -hmm. We have I think, a... Uh... I think Walt Disney would have... I think, they, I think there would be an official Disney podcast, which actually is none. That's amazing. Yeah. Hmm. Why well, is we, that? Yeah, why... Uh, I don't know. Um, years they don't ago, compete with you, a, Lou. <laughs> no, they, they had Disneyland had one for a very brief period of time around the 50th anniversary. Michael Gohagen was actually the the host of that, and then it went away, and they never sort of got on board with the uh, with the pie. Maybe they still will, you know, as this sort of next revolution of of podcasting is uh, is starting to happen. I think in the next 12 to 18 months, who knows. Well, we, we have another Disney podcast person in the chat room. This is the Disney Nerds Podcast, and they have a good question that will apply to any of us who are podcasters. They want to know what the best way to get your show to be interactive and get good fan uh, good feedback from the listeners. Now, so maybe you're not even to the point where you can do some of these events, but really just to get that interaction going, to get that first feedback. Um, that's, that's totally it. So first, you obviously need to give them a place to go. Right? So if you just have a podcast and you don't have a website or a blog, Facebook may be not the best choice, but even like a Facebook group or a Facebook page, give them a destination to go to. And on your show, talk to them. Like, ask them questions. Give them an opportunity and a reason to respond. So, for example, I do a trivia question every week. One, because I like to share the knowledge that I want people to learn a little bit more about the place, but I want them to get involved. And it's not about the prizes you give away. It could be little, you know, silly little things. It could be a PDF that you send them or, or just acknowledging them on the show, but make them feel, let them be a part of what you are doing. Look, I've had people who are listeners turn out to be guests and then regular guests on the show because they bring valuable content. Let them submit show ideas. Let you know. Ask them questions on Twitter and Facebook. Don't just push. Don't just push out content. You want to sort of get things from them as well. Mm. Okay, so uh, Lou, for someone who's on the fence there, and they say, "All right, I understand how to push out the content, but I don't understand how to how to let them uh, be involved." I mean, let, let's take a deeper dive on that because if I'm new and I don't know how to do that, what, what advice do you have? So figure out. A, ask them a question of the week. Figure out mm -hmm. what do you want them to know. Let them tell their story. Let Get their opinion on something. It doesn't have to be a knowledge-based question. It could be, hey, what's your favorite restaurant in Walt Disney World and why? What's your favorite you know, episode of The Greatest American Hero and why? What was your favorite TV show from the 80s? Whatever it might be, give them a chance to respond and tell their story. Set up a voicemail line. Right? You can do it for free from things like Call 8 or Google Voice is free. Uh, SpeakPipe is another way they can record it right from their um, right from their desktop or, or their laptop computer, whatever it may be. Give them opportunities to respond back. Give them a reason to respond as well. No, I love it. That's great. And Josh has a question. He wants to know. Uh, I, I get you have a charity and you have a, a WDW running team. Talk about that and talk about what the charity is a little bit. Um, all right. So um, this is always hard. Um, 
when I started writing my first book uh, back in 2003, um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, I was still living in New Jersey. And every day we drove into Sloan Kettering in New York um, for treatment. And as we would go to where we would have to go, we would always pass by the pediatric cancer ward. Um, and I saw those, you know, the, the kids that were in there, and I thought about what I was doing. And I said, you know, I, I take for granted my ability to go down to Walt Disney World. And we talk about things like Disney magic and how special this place is. And I want to do something for those kids. And I knew that raising money and, and putting it to research, they would never get the benefit of that. So I said, let me take portions of the proceeds from any from the book and then any products I create later on and I'll put that towards a wish granting organization. I worked with Starlight Starbright and now we have a very close relationship with Make a Wish Foundation of America. And I started doing that just on my own. And again, a testament to the community. Like they saw that and they said, hey man, like we want to do that too. Like how can we help? So we started doing things like charity auctions and you know different types of events that had a charity component to it. And uh, in 2008, because I was kind of dared to by my <laughs> former co-host, uh, I ran, in air quotes, my first Walt Disney World half marathon, right? It was me and my wife and one other person, and we raised some money for charity. And other people said, hey, I, if, God, if fat, stubby little leg Lou can do it, I can do that too. We want to run too. And, uh, you know, this, this team starts to be born out of it, and the team starts raising money for Make-A-Wish Foundation. Now we have like 300 members across the world that run in marathons in world and land and, and on the cruise line. We've got special events. We've got auctions both online and offline. And to date, and this has nothing to do with me, man. It is all about those people and that community and their time and their money and their merchandise and their efforts. We've raised more than a quarter of a million dollars for the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. And that is really the most important part of what I do. That, yeah, that's awesome. I, and I can tell, obviously, from your reaction and, and where this all started, how important this is to you. And this is huge. I mean, that's something that all of us as podcasters, we would love to have the, the platform to be able to organize something like that, that it is making such a big impact. So, uh, you know, thank you for doing that. That's awesome. I, I know everyone in the chat room uh, already was starting to, as soon as I started asking the question, there were some people uh, warning us of emotions to come, but I think that's, it, it's, <laughs> it's good. for good reason, for good reason. I was digging my fingernails into my hands, so, and <laughs> like I said, man, it, it's about them, like, they are the ones who do it, and, and it's amazing to see this outpouring of support from people, and then when we get to meet some of these families that come down, and these, these kids and their parents, like, they forget about the hospitals, they forget about, like, doctors and they forget about being sick, man, there is nothing more like beautiful and rewarding um, than being able to see that. Man, I love it. Okay, so uh, there are podcasters here who do have a little bit of an audience. What can we do with a little bit of an audience to, to give back, to, to do something more than just sharing content through a podcast, to, to actually do something in the community or make a difference? Like the numbers of your downloads, the numbers of your community, the numbers of the amount of money you raise doesn't matter. Right? We mm -hmm. all start small. We didn't start by raising a quarter million dollars. We started with $10, $100, $1,000, and it grows from there. There's lots of easy ways. There's things like first giving. Put a, go to sign up at first giving. Pick the charity that means something to you right? or maybe is organic to what your podcast is about. Give them an easy way to donate. Give them an easy way to participate. Do things like you know small – you can run little um, – you know, online auctions um, right from your website. That's how we've done it for years. You know, there's no uh, secret sauce. There's no magic website or technology that we're using. It, it's very simple. It's very organic. And reach out to your audience. Like, ask them. Say, hey, do you guys want to help? I guarantee you'll be surprised at, and again, I don't care if you have 100 downloads a week, you'd be surprised if people say, yeah, man, I, I'd love to help. How can I do it? How can I be a part of it? What can we do? How can we raise money? Um, and there's tons of easy ways to do it. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna jump in here and ask a question for Christian because it seemed like he was maybe having some, um, some chat room problems, but he asked this of all our guests, and Christian always wants to know, what sort of automation do you use in your online business? So he specifically asks about podcasts usually, but you, you have a, a something more than podcasting. So what automation tools do you use? <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm laughing because do as I say, not as I do, because podcasting <laughs> has gotten a lot easier. But I've I've just been so used to doing it for the past ten years that you know I I do sort of take a 
a much longer method than I probably need to to create my feed and create my show notes and push the COD podcast out. But I want it to be just so under certain things uh, it, that I want to sort of just be a certain way. Uh, in terms of automation, the real thing I think that I've done and I've learned this over the past few years is that at some point you realize you can only scale yourself so large and you need help. And I understand mm -hmm. the importance of team. Again, reach out to your tribe first. Reach out to your, your community. They want to help you, right? They like what you're doing. So find out places that you can get some easy help. Things like, you know, transcribing a podcast or creating show notes or doing social media. Reach out to them and say, hey, I need help in this thing. And as you start to whittle away some of these little things that suck off your time, it allows you to do the things that you are uniquely qualified to do, which is record your show and answer emails and do certain things that are you. So the automation really has come from surrounding myself by a, a good team of, of people that, you know, I, came from my community. Mm. Um, well, yeah, and that gives them a chance to, to get involved and, and help out. And yeah, I love that. that that's different too. A, a lot of people would have uh, interesting answers to that. That's a unique answer. Were we looking for more of a technology-based perspective? Uh, well, I, I know that uh, Christian specifically, uh, he, he's into the things like the if this, then that, and the buffer, oh, and, the yeah, okay. and, and things like that. Do you use any tools like that for pr uh, promotion, for marketing, with social media, things like um, any, any of that stuff? Yeah, I, I reluctantly, um, because I never liked scheduling anything. I don't like scheduling mm -hmm. tweets. I don't like scheduling Facebook. I want it to be, I am the, pro look, any tweet that comes from me is going to come from me. I did start to automate in terms of, blog posts and podcast episodes as they're posted in WordPress you can now allow it to to push out to your social channels so if a new episode goes up or a new blog post goes up it does go to Twitter it goes to my Facebook page in terms of uh, my posts I still like to keep them natural and organic but I do use tools like Buffer uh, social oomph are great in terms of, if, especially if you have like old content. Remember if somebody finds you today they may not know that you have like 10 awesome episodes behind that it's a good way to sort of schedule some earlier content. Um, Hootsuite is another great tool I used to use. I think that if, if my computer and my iPhone, God forbid, exploded tomorrow, the first things I would download would be Dropbox and Evernote. Right. Without a doubt. I live on those every day. Good stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, we had somebody ask uh, why you won't sell him the Disney, uh, the Dream Cruise <laughs> well, sign in the background. Um <laughs> But I, you know, I'm I'm sure there's uh, an inside story there. Uh, but what I want to know is, you've got a lot of memorabilia behind you. You got some toys on the bookshelf, or maybe collectibles. I don't, you know, collectibles. Yeah, come collectibles, on, man. Collectibles, not toys. <laughs> I, I knew that. I knew as soon as I said it. But what I want to know is, what's your most prized possession in that room you're in right now? And follow up, can you show us? Yeah. So <laughs> that sign uh, is actually a hand carved, hand painted wood sign from our cruise last year. This guy took the logo and he whittled it or whatever tool he used to do it. He hand carved that sign and brought it to me at an event a few months later. He didn't want anything. He spent however many crazy stupid hours doing it and he just said, I just want to say thank you. Like I had an awesome time on the cruise and, and I was floored. And I say that because I get that a lot and I mean that in the most grateful, like humble way. Like, the fact that somebody took their time to make that sign and make that sign and make some of the other stuff that's on there and send it to me. Look, man, I get all kinds of cool and weird stuff in the mail. Somebody made me an Ewok costume. I kid you not. I could walk onto the set of episode seven, not that I hope that they have Ewoks, and wear this costume because she knew I was a big Star Wars nerd and it was the only character size that I actually fit in. Um, <laughs> in terms of most valuable collectible, um, God, I'm going to give you the lawyer answer and say, you know, there's value in terms of... Well, no, no, I want to know your most prized possession, what you value the most. <laughs> so I'm trying to think, if there's a fire in the house and I can only grab one thing, what would it be? Um, You're overthinking so, it. <laughs> I am overthinking it. So I do have a, uh, I have an original recording of Mary Poppins and sheet music that Richard Sherman, who wrote the music, signed and wrote a very nice note to me. That and an opening, I have a, um, uh, an e-ticket and a full book of A through E tickets from the opening year of Walt Disney World. So that's probably the two of the things that I would grab. Wow. 
What what is the uh, what's the there's a note in here about the basement. What's the pile of stuff in the basement? <laughs> Is that like the basement in the Alamo joke? It or? is like there is there's no basement in the Alamo. So um, I've been collecting Disney stuff since I was a little kid, and you know, especially we just accumulate stuff over time, right? And as I've moved from New Jersey to Naples to Orlando, I have boxes and boxes of stuff that I swear I'm going to go through and I'm going to catalog it. And I'm going to display it, and it's still sitting there. So in my garage, because we have no basements in Florida, as you know. Mm. Uh, I have probably 20 big storage boxes filled with Disney memorabilia and collectibles and Star Wars stuff and stuff that I've gathered over the years that I realize I'm never going to take out. I obviously don't need it. I would rather let it go to somebody who's really going to appreciate it. So I've been putting stuff up on eBay, A, to get it out of the garage and my oh-so-stuffed closet back there, but to let it go to people that I know will put it on display and we'll read it and we'll, we'll appreciate it. So um, whoever it was, that's probably a box person that asked that question. More stuff is going on eBay soon. Well, they, they say if there was a fire, you uh, D- David Potts says you'd be running out of the house carrying the 20,000 leagues port hole. That's true. I probably would, okay. although it weighs a, a metric. So uh, a cast member years ago when they shut down 20,000 leagues under the sea got mm. me one of the portholes from the side of the, the ride vehicle. So... Uh, like everything else, it's still sitting in a box in my garage, although I swear I'm going to put it on display someday. <laughs> I love it. That's well, cool. Lou, well, one of the questions we always have to ask before we get to the end is for those of us going to Podcast Movement 2014 or also available, if you've got the virtual ticket and can't make mm-hmm. it, the virtual ticket will have recorded sessions or recordings of all the sessions. Lou, what is your topic going to be on at Podcast Movement 2014? So, Jared, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm talking about uh, taking the using sort of online engagement and bringing it offline, right? The importance that I think we forget about of the one-on-one, face-to-face interactions, how to do it, why to do it, and, yeah, how to get a return on that investment of your time, too. Awesome. Jared, you're speechless. I am speechless because I'm going to attend that session. Because <laughs> that, <laughs> Jared, I, I think you're going to be a little busy. I'm just I saying. Gonna, Jared, I, I have not, I've, I've not called you out at on that at all on Podmove Live, but we're on, you know, what our tenth or our twelfth week of doing this. And first of all, every speaker you say you're going to be on their session, but second of all. You're saying you're going to be have time to be on these sessions. We have uh, we have some responsibilities at this event, so I think maybe you and I will both be watching these sessions on the previously mentioned virtual ticket. I've, but it, but it's Lou yes. Lou Monbello. All right. All right. So so Lou, I mean, we we are going to start to wrap things up. Uh, obviously, you have a lot of the box peeps here, but for the people that aren't the box peeps, uh, what is the best location for them to go check out what's going on with Walt Disney World Radio? Cool. So all the Disney stuff that I do, the home is wdwradio.com. You can also find out about some of the non-Disney stuff that I'm doing and learn more about me uh, at lumongello.com. It's L-O-U-M-O-N-G-E-L-L-O.com. And I'm at Lou Mangiello on Twitter and Pinterest and Facebook and all those places. So please, hopefully, uh, connect with me there. Excellent. So Lisa, real quick, wants to know how long does it take Lou to edit one of his shows? So to produce a show, which is different than editing, um, again, it's probably a more streamlined way to do it. It probably takes me six hours, um, but I really don't edit a lot because I want the interviews or conversations or segments. I don't edit out alms and urs because it's just talking, man. I want it to feel like you're sitting at the table, so I don't do much editing at all unless I say something really, really stupid. <laughs> that's that's probably never happened, right, Lou? A lot. So. <laughs> well, before we sign off, I do have to say that Lou, uh, if you're in Dallas and you can't find Lou at the conference, he's probably either touring <laughs> Dallas Cowboys Stadium or yeah. he's uh, actually attending the preseason game that night because Lou just cannot wait for Cowboys season <laughs> to start. So I, I do got to say that's that's where we'll find Lou if we can't find him at the conference. Let me grab my giant helmet and bring that in here. I'll probably be at, I'll probably be eating. If you can't find me at the conference, I'm sure I'll, I'll be eating somewhere. 
<laughs> All right, so Lou, as we start, as we wrap this up, uh, what what are your final thoughts for the podcast focused people in the uh, chat tonight? So first, um, and Jared and Dan, like I thank you guys so much for not just the chat tonight and for inviting me to to, to be part of your event, but for for having the foresight to put together an event like Podcast Movement, a podcast focused event where everyone is welcome, no matter their their if they're just starting out or if they've been doing it for a long time, I think you guys have really hit on something that is going to continue to grow. I know you guys, I'm sure, were probably overwhelmed by the response that you guys got, especially not knowing out of the gate what you were going to get. Um, I'm very, very excited for this conference, and I think where this conference is potentially going to lead in the next couple of years, assuming Jared actually helps at the conference and doesn't go to sessions the entire time. Um <laughs> But if you are a uh, if you're a new podcaster and you haven't started yet, stop making excuses. Like stop. The, you're always going to find a reason to not do it. Just sit down. Don't worry about the technology. Just start recording. Just find your voice. Get three to five shows in the can and then release it. Right. This way you know you can do it. You find your voice. You get your rhythm. You've got stuff for people to listen to, and then you'll be probably very very surprised. And just hang in there. Like don't worry about the numbers. Please, for the love of God, don't worry about money. Like, do what you love. The money will come later. Well, Lou, I really appreciate your example and how to uh, generously connect with your audience and, and your friends, as you call it. I love how you call them your friends because they are your friends and you treat them as such. And that's a great example to the rest of us. And then uh, just want to brag on you real quick as we close out. Um, when this event was the idea was hatching and we went around and we asked friends and people to be involved and, and people to come and speak and, and participate you were one of the first people to jump on board and, and catch that vision even though we had not uh, had all these successful Kickstarter campaigns and all these other speakers jumping on so I just really appreciate your leadership in podcasting and jumping on board with this and, and helping us to grow this to what it is now and, and we're excited to be in Dallas with you next month Awesome. Thank you again, man. I, I am honored to be uh, to be part of this, especially uh, in the, the first year. So thank you very much. Well, you're welcome, Lou. Thank you. And for everyone listening, again, to find out more about Lou and to check out WDW Radio, it's at WDWRadio.com. For more on the podcast movement, you can go to PodcastMovement.com. But with that, for Jared, for Lou, I'm Dan. Thanks for joining us again, guys. Thanks, Lou. All right, thanks, guys.